Mr. Undersecretary, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much for being here and the opportunity for me to be amongst you this afternoon. Thank you to our co-host, the government and people of Italy. And please uh, bear with me as I share with you some of the things that I have bought here from our far Pacific corner of the world. First of all, in Palau and the islands of the Pacific, one of the criteria for a good husband is that he must be a good fisherman. Obviously, my family will have to buy fish while I'm here in New York. But I am here because I am a fisherman. And just in my one generation alone, I have seen the impacts on the oceans and the dwindling stocks of the oceans. And so I fear, I truly fear for the future of our islands, the future of our culture, but most especially the future of our children and the next generation. There was a time when as a fisherman, I could see great stocks of fish. I could choose which fish to take. It's like a pick and choose. Now, that is not the case anymore. The fixed stocks are smaller, they're dwindling in size, and it's definitely not sustainable if we don't do something about it. So let me share with you, excellencies and friends, that Palau is home to some of the world's most scenic islands, lagoons and reefs, and some of the world's greatest biodiversity, including 1,300 species of fish and 700 species of corals. Our people have long understood that they are the stewards of this rich endowment, and there is a strong sense of responsibility attached to this stewardship. And that Palau's past, present, and future are tied to the health of our natural environment, particularly our oceans. You know, our local chiefs may not have fully understood the signs of their environment, but they lived in harmony with their surroundings. They understood that the people's health and prosperity rose and fell with the tides. When resources became scarce, they declared a bull, what we might today refer to as a moratorium. Reefs would be deemed off limits during spawning and feeding periods so that the ecosystem would replenish itself and fish stocks would remain abundant. Certain areas like Rugui were given permanent protection because of their important biodiversity. The goal was not conservation for its own sake, but to restore the balance between people and nature. The best science now confirms that our approach to managing the ocean is sound. The traditional ethos of the bull is actually enshrined in Palawan law. Article 6 of Palau's constitution requires Palau's government to take positive action to conserve a beautiful, healthful, and resourceful natural environment. With this cultural and political mandate, Palau has led the Micronesian challenge to conserve at least 30% of nearshore marine resources and 20% of the terrestrial resources. We have created the Protected Areas Network, a national framework for community-based conservation. And we have implemented some of the world's most stringent regulations outlawing bottom trolling. And yes, we created the first shark sanctuary. And the southern lagoons have also been designated as World Heritage Sites. These initiatives have helped sustain the vitality of Palau's waters. But I return again and again to a question my forebears never conceived of. 
how much will Palau's efforts matter if the world is not on the same page? The international community has allowed fish tax to plummet. Once thought to be limitless, more than 80% of global fish stocks are now fully or overexploited. Reckless and destructive fishing practices, overfishing, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing have robbed us of our resources. They must be stopped. New and advanced fishing technology have also played a role in the dwindling fish stocks. Pollution is saturating our waters. The, the Pacific is home to a plastic gyre inconceivable in its size. Remote parts of Palau, areas uninhabited for centuries, are, limited, are littered with someone else's garbage. Ocean acidification and bleaching are, decim are decimating coral reefs and coastal habitats that once teemed with life. Climate change is causing the seas to rise at unprecedented rates, increasing the intensity of storms. In the last two years, my friends, two of the most powerful storms in history, Super Typhoon Bofa and Super Typhoon Haiyan, have decimated our shores. Haiyan displaced the entire population of our northern state of Kayangal. People from that island will not return to their home for at least a year. Palau is north of the Pacific Typhoon Belt, so we rarely never experienced these disasters before. We are grateful to our partners for helping to clean up and rebuild, but we know that these disasters will continue and will likely get worse. If our partners really want to help, they should reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and agree to an international agreement that will protect Palau's and others' future. Given the enormity of these threats, the need for simultaneous international and domestic action is obvious. This week's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Working Group meetings provides the context for what is needed internationally. Yesterday, I had the honor to speak on behalf of the Pacific Small Island Developing States at the, workers group, at the working group's meetings on oceans. The PCs are leading the campaign for a standalone sustainably, sustainable development goal on healthy, productive, and resilient oceans and seas. As a group, we have called on the international community to recognize the central role of oceans and seas in nature and their provision of food, jobs, health, and culture to our peoples. The Millennium Development Goals proved that we can make historic gains by marshalling resources around a common cause and bringing stakeholders, governments, NGOs, the private sector, and local communities together. Even the most cynical among us must marvel at the millions that were educated, vaccinated, and raised out of poverty as a result of the MDGs. The same should be true for the SDGs and oceans. Investments in sustainable ecotourism, local fisheries, marine management, data collection, and monitoring, control, and surveillance of our waters can make a generational transformative impact. We require only the right tools and the right partnerships to protect our environment, grow our economies, and enrich our people's lives. A standalone SDG is the best way to tackle the interconnected issues of the ocean environment and our best chance to align all stakeholders to make progress on the commitments the international community has already made. Until the international community can agree on a holistic SDG type framework and implement programs to reverse the devastation to our oceans and seas, I will work to declare Palau's waters closed to commercial fishing. 
and make our 200 miles EEG a marine sanctuary. <laughs> My friends, make no mistake. This is not an effort to lock up Palau's waters and throw away the key. Like a bull, ending commercial fishing will give nature a chance to heal from what the scientists are telling us is the damage caused by the intensive fishing, intensive fishing pressures. It will also release the vast potential of our waters to provide more food for our people, more fish for the region, and to grow Palau's economy. These objectives, environmental health, food security, and economic growth are the very essence of sustainable development. You might wonder how closing our waters to lucrative commercial fishing will help Palau's economy grow. The answer is simple. Palau's economic potential lies in tourism, not tuna. Tourism, in fact, already provides more than half of our GDP, and it depends upon our pristine marine environment. I always like to say, the economy is our environment, and the environment is our economy. Palau's homes and villages are beautiful places, but it is our pristine reefs, our sharks, our rock islands, and our beaches that more than 100,000 tourists a year come to experience. By now, I think we all know the research studies that have shown that a shark may be worth several hundred dollars death as a, of a, a fin soup, but a live shark is worth 1.9 million during its lifespan because of the many snorkelers and scuba, scuba divers who come to our corner of the world to see them alive. If we can grow that sector sustainably, we can replace lost income from fishing while preserving the marine environment, which is our heritage. What we need, my friends, are the right partners to help make this bull effective and enforceable. Many of you are in this room today. We hope to access technology to monitor illegal vessels in our waters. And we need to measure the rising tides so that we can prepare for and respond to extreme weather and avoid disasters when the coming storms pass through. This technology exists. I am eager to learn more about how it works. For it is only by taking control of our territory and our sovereignty that we can ensure that generations more of Palawans can preserve their heritage and enjoy the natural bounty provided to us. People who care about this earth and the plight of others understand why we're all connected to this initiative. And my God, I hope my children grow up to be good fishermen someday. Together, we can make it work. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President.